Well, I see myself as a whistleblower. So, I mean, like you said, I've been in the system for over 40 years. I've seen a tremendous amount of waste of tax dollars and students' time. And I feel like if I don't say it, who will? So much of what of what passes for education is neither. It's neither useful nor fun. And that's where I say, hold on, that seems like a giant waste. Isn't there some way that we could avoid it? Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with thought leaders such as Kevin Kelly, Brad Feld, Steve Blank, Gretchen Rubin, Tim Harford, Adam Grant, Tim O'Reilly, Tyler Cowan, and many, many more on topics that will help you gain a distinct advantage, not only in the world of creativity and innovation, but in your entire professional and personal life. Each and every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some short, high-impact and easily digestible insights to have you finishing your week on a high. Future Squared is powered by Collective Campus, a corporate innovation school, consultancy and startup accelerator that works with large organizations to help them unlock their people's often latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, creating a culture of innovation, or partnering with startups, visit collectivecampus.io. So without further ado, let's get into today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 222 with Brian Kaplan. Brian is a professor of economics at George Mason University. He's the author of The Myth and the Rational Voter, which was named the best political book of the year by the New York Times. He wrote Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids and the newly released The Case Against Education, Why the Education System is a Waste of Time and Money, which forms the basis of today's conversation. Brian is currently collaborating with Saturday Morning Breakfast Winersmith on All Roads Lead to Open Borders, a non-fiction graphic novel on the philosophy and social science of immigration, and is also writing a new book called Poverty, Who to Blame. His work has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, American Economic Review, Economic Journal, Journal of Law and Economics and Intelligence, and he's appeared on ABC, Fox News, MSNBC, and C-SPAN. Brian and I went an inch deep and a mile wide in this conversation. Discover why Brian, a celebrated career academic himself, thinks that the education system is a waste of time and money, how today's education system teaches for short-term memory retention rather than comprehension, and two solutions Brian has proposed to help solve the problems with today's education system. I didn't agree with Brian on a number of topics. Namely, he seems to completely disregard the threat of technology and automation on employment, suggesting that there is a lack of evidence of this and using the fact that we've always created more jobs than we've destroyed in the past to forecast the future of employment. The thing about the past is that we never had technology like the kind we possess today and the kind we'll possess in the near future. He also says that people can't learn how to learn. On the latter point, I suspect that this had more to do with the way I framed the question so as to not elicit the response I was expecting. A simple example of getting better at learning is teaching someone else what you've read in a book rather than just reading the words on a page. This is more likely to aid comprehension and retention, at least in the short term. Nonetheless, as you hear Brian suggest in the lightning round, it's important to collect evidence and opinions from different fields, from different people, to get all sides of the story and challenge your own belief system and avoid confirmation bias. This is one of the reasons why I enjoy hosting this show so much, because I get to interview and speak with experts in their own fields who contradict experts in other fields. It forces me to expand my own view of the world. And when it comes to learning, Socrates was right. The more we know, the more we know that we don't know. And that is why we keep learning. And that is why I keep interviewing thought leaders across a range of disciplines, just like Brian. With that, enjoy today's conversation on the case against education with the one and only Brian Kaplan. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks for having me. That's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, and you're joining me all the way from Oakton, Virginia. That is correct. Quite a I was, well, I was having this conversation with you prior to uh, hitting the little red button that it's eight degrees Celsius over there in the afternoon, in which you said, "Well, it's actually not too bad." But I guess it's all relative, seeing as I'm joining you from Melbourne, Australia, where eight degrees Celsius is a very, very, very cold winter's morning, whereas 
in Oakton, Virginia, that's a reasonably warm winter afternoon. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Look, Brian, I've been really excited uh, to chat with you today. I've been looking forward to this conversation um, because we are going to talk about your new book called The Case Against Education, Why the Education System is a Waste of Time and Money. First up, congratulations on the release of the book, Brian. Thanks a lot. Um, so you've effectively been in school for more than 40 years. Uh, first preschool, oh, yeah. kindergarten, elementary school, junior high, high school. Then, of course, you went to university and then you became an economics professor at George Mason University. Yet you're effectively lashing out at the system that made you saying it's a waste of time and money. Why is that? Well, I see myself as a whistleblower. So, I mean, as you said, I've been in the system for over 40 years. I've seen a tremendous amount of waste of tax dollars and students' time. And I feel like if I don't say it, who will? Mm -hmm. Also, you know, coming from the horse's mouth, as is the saying, um, it may hold more weight. And um, yeah, 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 exactly. So if I were just some guy with a blog who would take it seriously, so like you know, just some guy who's jealous that he can't get an academic job. So mm -hmm. I've got one. I've, I've got this dream job for life, but. Yeah. I mean, my conscience bothers me. I should. I think I should at least let people know that their money is not achieving what they think it's achieving. That makes perfect sense. And I think a, a lot of uh, skeptics, well, a lot of people will push back and say, "Yeah, but college graduates uh, get paid a lot more than people who just have a high school diploma." And I think in your in, in your book you refer to the fact that earnings premiums for college graduates have skyrocketed to seventy three percent in mm -hmm. the in the 70s. U.S. anyway. Yeah, in the U.S. anyway, and in the 70s, it was something like 50%. So, I mean, what do you say to that? Right. So I say there's really two very different ways that education can raise your earnings. Mm -hmm. One of them is by actually teaching you useful job skills. Mm -hmm. Another one, though, is by signaling or showing off your skill. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, in other, yeah, so in other words, you know, so like you're jumping through a bunch of hoops, you can get stickers on your forehead. And my story is that – most of the payoff from education is that second round. Most of it is about impressing employers. It's not about learning things that you're going to then subsequently use when you actually have a job. Yeah. And then I, go, then I go on to say that selfishly speaking, it doesn't really matter why education pays. But from the point of view of society, it matters tremendously. Because you know, if, you, if you send people to school and they become actually better workers, then they can go and increase the size of the pie. But if, if the main thing they do is get a bunch of stickers in their forehead, well, then the point of the stickers is to get you a bigger slice of a pie the same size. So imagine yeah. everyone has 20 stickers on their forehead. They're completely covered in stickers. That doesn't mean that the workers are all going to be awesome. It means that you need a whole bunch of stickers to be considered worthy of employment, yeah. which is basically the economy that I see all around the world now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you basically refer to this as uh, as signaling, effectively just signaling to employees that you have the pre-existing abilities required to mm -hmm. perform well at a particular job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, I don't deny that people learn some useful skills in school, but I mm -hmm. say that the lion's share come, uh, of the payoff comes from just convincing employers that you're worthy by jumping through all these hoops. And again, it's not just about showing that you're smart. You're also showing that you've got oh, you got a nice package. You know, you got your brains. Mm -hmm. You got work ethic. And also, very importantly, you just have sheer conformity. You're just willing to submit to social expectations that you complete this degree. And since there is so much emphasis upon the wonder of completing degrees in our society, people who don't do it really scare employers off. Like, what's wrong with this person that they wouldn't mm. just knuckle down and do what they're supposed to do? Yeah. I know you've, you made mention of that in an article, I believe it was on Forbes, where someone might quit college to go off and solve some really complex mathematical equation, but they would still struggle to find a job because they had left college. Yeah, because you say, well, look, you, you're sure you're smart and you put a lot of time in, but you only work hard as far as we can tell on something that you think is worthwhile. But of course, most jobs are about working hard on something somebody else thinks is worthwhile. Mm. I mean, you know, those are two pretty different things. You know, mm. there are, you know, there are people who will be part of a team and do what they're supposed to do, and then there's people who have a lot of talent and drive, but who just don't play well with others. And there's almost no business where you can use people who just won't go and and work and, and work as part of the team. I mean, it's one thing to have a little bit of initiative or creativity, you know, you know but to you know, someone who just says, "I question the fundamental goals of this organization." Well, you don't want that person working for you. The person yeah. is a pain in the neck. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, as a founder of an organization, you definitely want people to comply. At the same time, I guess you want to empower them to, to help 
drive the uh, direction of the organization to some degree. And I guess what you're talking about there, fundamentally, we're talking about two different types of people. I mean, people who work, who play nice in an organization, say a large organization, they join a pre-existing team with a pre-existing way of doing things versus, say, your entrepreneur who heads off and does their own thing, who would perhaps struggle to conform with society's expectations Mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, although, of course, most successful entrepreneurs first learn the business by being a follower, and then once they're good enough, then they branch out and they become a leader. So, you know, again, you, so again, like the, like the truly, totally defiant person, very hard for them even to get started, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, like, like, you know, it's pretty unusual that someone founds a company who's just never worked as part of a team before. Normally, you first learn the business, and then you become an entrepreneur, which is, you know, the common sense approach. You don't, well, you know, like, I'm going to start off as the general of the army before I'm a, before I'm a private. Yeah. Uh, you know, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And we, we say Appe- that. Appe- appealing, but not uh-huh. very effective. Yeah, yeah. And I say that all the time where we'll have uh, people come through our uh, co-working uh, facility who literally have just come out of high school and they're off and running, starting their own company, but they haven't picked up many of the fundamental uh, skills required to work with other people, to, to lead a team, you know, the fundamentals of business 101 and stuff like that. It's it's just lacking. And, you know, I've seen great entrepreneurs who have come through that have spent, say, five, ten years perhaps in the corporate world or in various um, team situations, then they've headed off and done their own thing because they picked up a lot of skills along the way and it wasn't just, okay, well, Mm -hmm. entrepreneurship sounds like this all-encompassing thing and, you know, if overnight success and everything else, let's go and do that, but it's not that easy. No way. Yeah. Um, So I guess what you're talking about, Earlier, Brian, on signaling, it reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, Seth Stevens Davidovich last year, who wrote a book called Everybody Lies. And in that book, mm-hmm. he basically concluded that Harvard grads get paid more, but it's not because of their Ivy League education. It's because they're smarter and more talented than the rest of us. And that's why they were admitted to the Ivy League in the first place. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... That, you know, so that you know, sort of on, on this issue of specifically how much does going to a more selective school actually wind up paying off? Mm-hmm. Uh, there, you know, there's a, there's a range of different research findings on this. There are a few people who get exactly the result you're talking about, but what most people get is more like a lot of the payoff for Harvard is because the students were better to begin with. But then there may be some additional payoff to being at that at the, at the top schools on uh, in, in addition to all of that. Uh, and then, you know, the other the other thing worth pointing out is there are a few occupations where even though you don't make more money, it may be that you can't get into that occupation at all unless you have the elite degree. So, you know, like my older sons are interested in being professors. And I don't know that I'll, I don't know that they're going to make more money if I go and send them to an Ivy League school, but I think it will make it a lot easier for them to become professors because they're going to go and get the, the stamps and the stick and the and the connections that they need in order to make it in this very tough game. Yeah. Yeah, and you keep referring to uh, stamps and, and these seals of approval, and we see that now even on platforms like LinkedIn, where people will go off and do some online course, like a, a massive online open course, and it's all just to get that little badge and put it up on their LinkedIn profile. Mm-hmm. But chances are that within, say, six months to a year of completing this online course, they may have forgotten everything about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, of course, if it's something that you do every day, then you're not too likely to forget it. But if it's something that you just did purely for the badge, then yeah, I mean, so... Um, you know, in, in the book, I, I, I quote, uh, you know, Tiger Mom Amy, Amy Chua when she says, uh, you know, I think this is on, on learning piano, but it really applies to everything. You know, every day you don't practice is a day you get worse. Yeah. Every yep. day, every day you don't practice a day you get worse. So that's true for really everything. It's one of the most general laws of learning and understanding is that you know, use it or lose it. So and then that's that's you know a big problem with the education system in general is that so much of what we study you never use it after the final exam and then you forget it, which raises the question of what was the point in the first place. Yeah, yeah, you've talked about this in your book where you say from kindergarten on students spent thousands of hours studying subjects irrelevant to the modern labor market and you know I know myself I've learned loads of useless stuff that I've long since forgotten whether it was primary mm-hmm. school, high school, university, um, even you know employment specific. Uh, certifications mm-hmm. that were done purely to satisfy some sort of continuous professional education um, requirements. And I guess there's something to be said there about having to learn something because it's mandated versus wanting to learn something because you enjoy it and you can apply it in mm-hmm. your everyday life. 
Yeah, or at least one of the two. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that you learn that's not fun, but it's useful, and so mm -hmm. it's still wor worth doing. Definitely. And then again, yeah, and then there's stuff that's fun for some people, but not useful. And again, I say that that's that's great too. But so much of what of what passes for education is neither. It's neither useful nor fun, and that's where I say, hold on, that seems like a giant waste. Isn't there some way that we could avoid it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean. What, why do we keep teaching the same thing then? I mean, it, it seems as if the education system, from the outside looking in, um, and this is why I'm having this conversation with yourself, because you're on the inside. I mean, it doesn't seem to have changed all that much since <laughs> the early 20th century. I mean, if I look at a primary or, or, school today, it's 20 kids, teacher, classroom. Mm -hmm. Remember what I'm saying, write it down later in the test, and maybe I'll give you a nice big green tick. So why isn't it changing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd go back and say I don't see that it's changed that much over the last thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, if you go and look at drawings of early schools, University of Paris, it still looks very much like a modern classroom with, you know, you got some monks going and taking notes in wax, but instead of paper. But it's the same thing, stage on the stage, you know, going on and people copying down what he's saying. Uh, you know, like, like as to why this model has stayed around for so long, I mean, so I mean, like, like first of all, it delivers the main thing that people are after, which is, you know, which is getting better jobs. Mm -hmm. So you know, like like the current system genuinely generally does usually uh, deliver on the promise that if you do well in school, then you'll get a better job after graduation. It'll be good for your career. So I say that's the main thing that students want anyway. And again, the main thing that employers want is to know that when they go and and pay extra for a worker with extra stickers on their forehead, that they're going to get a good worker. Understanding anything deeper, I mean, it doesn't really especially pay the individuals to worry about it all that much. Uh, but you know, but again, they're like, why is it that we just can't go and improve it? You know, so I mean, I think there's a bunch of things going on. I mean, so one of them is just that almost all schools are nonprofits, so there's just not that much pressure on them to actually do anything better. I mean, it's one thing. So like, if a teacher just completely you know did nothing, then probably people would get on would get on his case. But if he just does the normal thing year after year for 50 years of his career, you no know, one like, like that's okay, right? Yeah, that's acceptable. It's it's above the bar, above the line. So good enough. Uh, and then the last thing that I say is, you know, since one of the main things that education signals is a sheer conformity, if someone were to come along and say, I have a brand new, original, creative, wonderful way of, sh of signaling conformity, there's a, there's a catch-22. Who wants to go and do this brand new, creative, wonderful way of signaling conformity? Probably the nonconformists, yeah. the people who want, who want to break out of the system. So I say that, that, that is whatever conformity signaling is, is important, like it is for education, that we do have this, uh, this extra level of lock-in where it's hard for an innovator to come along and offer something different because the first people likely to jump ship are going to be people that are not doing well in the current system and have some problem. Mm, yeah, and um, I think I draw parallels between what you said there and and corporate executives uh, who try to drive change. Uh, you often get so much pushback and there's, there's a, it's a very tangled web of bureaucracy and politics mm -hmm. and vested interests. And I guess if you're a teacher or an academic who comes along and says, we've got a better way, chances are you've got hundreds of faculty pushing back because they don't want change. They're quite happy doing things the way they've always been done. Yeah, inertia is always a problem. I mean, I think it definitely is a lot worse in the nonprofit sector mm -hmm. than in the profits, in the for-profit sector. In the for-profit sector, all the stuff you're saying is true, but still, if you're a CEO and you've got an idea that will pay a lot if you if you switch to it, you might say, "Hey, I'm willing to make a ton of enemies because there's a ten million dollar payday in it for me." Mm -hmm. And tough luck, you know. Yeah, five thousand people that I fire and replace with with robots may hate me, but are they going to give me ten million dollars? If uh, I don't think so, so it's, it's just going to be too bad for them. It's kind of feel kind of sorry for them, but I don't feel ten million dollars sorry for them. So you know, there, there's that. And then on top of this, uh, like in the for-profit sector, there's just a lot more room for attrition. So there's been very good work done by economists showing what seems pretty obvious, which is that high productivity firms are more likely to survive and expand, and low productivity, productivity firms are more likely to shrink and die. So that this is another way that you wind up getting innovation in more innovation in the for-profit sector, which is just that since for-profit firms are allowed to perish if they don't do well, then you, then just by attrition, you know, you know, things tend to improve in the for-profit sector. Yeah, yeah. And I say this all the time amongst uh, early stage startups as well, where you do have, say, constraints in place by way of lack of human resources, lack of financial resources, but it forces people to be very, at least the good startups, it forces them to be very diligent about how they spend every dollar, mm -hmm. making sure they get the business model right, they use the right marketing channel, they don't overextend on every any particular building mm -hmm. block of their business model. Whereas in certain economies where the government is really just throwing money at startups, startups are getting founded 
day in, day out, and they're shutting their doors day in, day out, and just going back to the government with their, you know, hands held out, asking for some more money and getting mm-hmm. it, and there's no risk. But when you have no safety net, you're forced to be a lot more diligent with every dollar to make sure you deliver outcomes that society actually values. Yeah, and I mean, and, and what you're describing is a lot better than it would be with education, where it's almost unheard of to allow a school or a university to go bankrupt, or certainly a public university to go bankrupt. Mm. Uh, so, you know, so like, you know, if they're doing poorly, then they need more. They obviously they need more money in order to survive. Well, what do you what, what do you think? What do you think? They're just going to disappear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know that's what one kind of, of the, uh, sorry. Go for it. Oh, what, what what kind of a monster are you? Yeah, yeah ex- exactly right. Um, and I mean, I'm kind of hop, skipping and jumping all over the place here. And I was going to talk about solutions later, but we're we're there right now. We're talking about um, education spending and not for profits. And one of the solutions you've proposed in your book is around cutting education spending mm-hmm. um, or educational austerity. Um, let's talk about that. Uh, yeah. So. One of the biggest facts to understand about the modern economy and education system is that since 1940, there's been tremendous credential inflation. Mm -hmm. What this means is that to get one and the same job that your dad or grandfather would have gotten, you now need about three more years of education compared to, say, 1940. And again, this is is for jobs like waiter or bartender or hotel concierge. Where, like you know, like it, like you know, as education or educational credentials proliferate, employers raise the bar, and you need more degrees to be impressive. Right. So, right. And, you know, like the, like the obvious reason for this is that as education has become more widespread, more accessible, then you, it takes more in order to signal excellence uh, than it used to in the past. And so, like, like you say, like, you know, in light of this, I say, like, the best way to go and really fix the system is to try to cause a credential deflation. And the ultimate, the only the way of doing that is just to reduce the ubiquity of the credentials so that employers, have to be less picky and where the stigma against people with fewer credentials goes away because there's so many people in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, you know, this, this always freaks people out because they're, they, you know, the picture will, what are you like? I mean, if there's one person who doesn't have the credential, then they're locked out. And I see, you know, it's really the wrong thought experiment to do. You should think about what would happen if a whole lot of people are locked out. Mm. One person's locked out, then, then it's terrible for them. But if a whole lot of people aren't able to get, say, go to college, this changes what the credential means. It no longer is the same black mark against you that it would be today. And it means that employers have a reason to be more open-minded and to just lower their expectations for how many useless degrees a person has to have in order to be good enough to, to, to give an interview to. Yeah, yeah. And um, I guess that's one of the areas I was keen to discuss today. And it seems to me that some organizations are at least – signaling to to the crowd that they are changing what they look for in terms of prerequisites in an employee. I know EY in, in the UK, it was probably about 18 months or 24 months ago, came out and basically said, look, we won't look at um, your, well, basically they said, it doesn't matter if you don't have an accounting degree. Yes, it is hmm. uh, desirable, but we will look at other attributes, um, other experiences, other qualifications that you might have that would be beneficial to us because they see that they want to start building a more diverse workforce, not not a, a visibly diverse workforce, but ide- ideologically diverse and educationally diverse. Did, yeah. did, did this firm say they don't care if you have a college degree of any kind or it's just that you doesn't have to be in accounting? It just doesn't have to be an accounting degree, so not necessarily yeah. discounting college degrees altogether, right. but I guess if more mm-hmm. employers start going down that road and, and acknowledging that, hey, perhaps it's not all about the degree. It's about these other attributes, character attributes, experiences that people might have that can deliver a lot of value for us, then that will change the game across the board because we're dealing with a huge tangled web of stakeholders, whether it's the students, their parents, the universities, the government, the employer, and you can't just have one of them say, okay, well, we're going to change the way we do things because it does affect everyone. Yeah, so I really hope that these innovations do take off. I'm skeptical that they're going to become more than more than a small niche. Mm. Again, because you know, the current system, it does have a perverse logic to it, which is that if in your society almost all of the good future workers go to college, then when you're deciding who to give an interview to, it really does make a lot of statistical sense to say, well, if you didn't go to college, we're not going to go and give you a chance. And you can say this knowing full well that there are some diamonds in the rough, some really good applicants that didn't go to college, as long as they're just too hard to find. If you have to go and interview 300 extra candidates to find three extra people that you're interested in hiring, mm-hmm. probably not going to be worth it because you know, like you know, time is money. Interviewing people is a, is a big burden on firms. So it makes a lot of sense for them to go and throw out less credentialed applicants. 
But at the same time, it doesn't make a lot of sense for society to foster and to uh, and to nurture a system where credentials are so, are so ubiquitous that you need to have a bunch of fancy degrees in order to be considered worthy of an interview. Yeah, yeah. So oftentimes credentials can be used effectively to ease the the workload of your HR department. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure, sure. Right, and, and you know, so there's there's them, but there's the question: like, would, would it make sense for the CEO to say, "Hey, HR, stop doing what you're doing, and here and here's a new plan: go and interview everybody." Mm-hmm. Right, <laughs> that's not going to work. Yeah. So then, like, like what specific instructions would you give them in order to try to scoop up the diamonds in the rough, the qualified mm-hmm. applicants that don't have the right credentials? It's really hard to actually uh, to do it that way. Yeah. So it's really hard to find those people, even though everybody knows they're out there. Yeah, definitely, and and I mean, I'm definitely no. Uh, head of a 10,000 employee organization, um, we're literally a team of 10, but we did some hiring recently and I didn't look at degree once. And I think we're seeing this a lot amongst a lot more early stage organizations, particularly in Silicon Valley and tech hubs around the world where they look for experiences and they look for people who are say T-shaped rather than being incredibly strong in one area. They might be strong in one area, but they've got experiences across the board. I mean, are you seeing... Evidence I mean, of can that. you even can you can you even get those experiences without a college degree in the first place? That seems pretty hard. The, so I mean, I mean, it's one thing to say we don't care about degrees, but if the other things you look at you can't get without college degrees, like experience, then it may not be so helpful. Well, um, you see, yeah, yeah. So in terms of Silicon Valley, I've talked to people there, and I've said so. I've heard that sometimes a person without a credential can get hired just by winning a programming contest or something yeah. like that, and they say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah it happens. And then when I say, right, like, well, what ratio of your of your employees at your top Silicon Valley firm are hired because of fancy credentials versus winning contests? Mm-hmm. And then it's like, yeah, we have like a thousand people with fancy credentials and five contest winners. So I mean, it is a case where you have to be twice as good to do half as well yeah. if you're going the unconventional route. Yeah. So again, it does, you know, it is possible, but. It doesn't seem like it's a major threat to the status quo, unfortunately. Yeah, I know, I know. That's a great point. So when I've made that observation that, you know, in my case and in many other uh, company cases, they hire just by looking at T-shaped individuals with lots of experiences. But like you say, they may have not been given the opportunity to have these experiences in the first place unless they had a degree. So even though you're discounting whether or not they have one, chances are they've got the experiences you desire because they had a degree mm-hmm. in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, and and it also freezes out people who are you know are these diamonds of the rough who have have what it takes but don't have the credentials. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, so, I mean, earlier we were talking about how education effectively signals and it gets us a better job at least in the short term. But now, and we were talking about this before we started recording, Brian, we're seeing technology displaced a lot of jobs. I mean, depending on which report you read, anywhere between 40 and 60% of today's jobs could be automated in the next, say, 15, 20 years, you know, depending on a number of variables. Yet, we're still teaching people the same thing to effectively take the same job because we think it's going to get them the financial security that they desire and the social desirability and everything else. But... I mean, if, if what's happening, say, in, in the Rust Belt in the United States is anything to go by where there's been a lot of pushback in the last, say, couple of years against you know, industry going offshore, we've seen the rise of, of, of Donald Trump um, and popularism and everything else. And oftentimes they point to, well, we haven't got a job. You know, we had the jobs years ago, but we're not being prepared ultimately for where the world is going. So, I mean, isn't that good enough reason for you know, universities for stakeholders in this um, web of education to take note and start changing the way things are done to prepare people for that future? Or are we just too focused on the short term? Well, I think there's a few things going on. I mean, the first thing I would just reject the premise and say it's not true that there's been a, that there's been an increase in, in automation. In fact, there's been there's been a lot less automation since 1970 than between 1970 or 1940 and 1970. Really, like the golden age of economic growth was in this uh, in this early post-war era. And you know, growth continues, but it just at a considerably slower pace. I think we now have a perception of the economy moving quickly because there are very dramatic innovations in a few highly visible industries. But if you go and look at the entire economy, then there's you know there's much less going on than you would think, and there's many occupations that are that are quite stagnant. So just like like the general idea that think that you know like when people make claims about how. Uh, you know, like, like, you know, like what are you saying? Like 20 to 60 percent of jobs could be automated. Well, could is a deliberate weasel word if you're paying attention, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, well, could. It's like not I'm not saying they will. I'm saying they could. All right. Well, I guess any. I guess it. I guess we could be hit by a meteor. 
But in terms of like what is a reasonable forecast, then I'd say it's vastly smaller than that. And, you know, like, again, I think the more reasonable thing is just to figure that automation is going to proceed in the next 20 years at about the same pace as it did in the previous 20 years, which would be, you know, a modest level. But, you know, but, you know, like, like not, not, nothing, you know, nothing, uh, nothing unprecedented. So, right. you know, I would say, yeah, so, so anyway, so I, mean, I would just say that it's just not true that think that there's going that there's likely to be traumatic changes. Again, and, you know, but like, like, then why does everyone think, think so? Because they get it based upon newspapers rather than statistics. You know, like stories can can be really dramatic, even when numbers are are super boring. And I think that's really the world we're in. Uh, but uh, you know, like suppose that that you know, the massive innovation were coming, would this would this mean that uh, schools were going to teach something very different? And I don't see much sign of that. You know, there's like like right now the curriculum is still very have very much bears the stamp of the 19th century. So in the 19th century, what universities taught were were, were prepared for three occupations: law, medicine, and the ministry. And if you take a look at the modern curriculum, it's it's eerily similar to what was done to what was in the curriculum in the night in the late 19th century at top American schools. There's been some changes, but you know, like, like essentially, professors keep teaching the same stuff that they were taught. And since everything is organized within academic departments, you know, each department, you know, especially, well, we're going to teach the same stuff that our department has always taught. You know, like if it becomes totally irrelevant to the modern world, then well, hopefully some students will still show up, and if not, taxpayers will probably bail us out. So it's mm. not going to be so bad. Uh, so I mean, uh, like I mean, what I would say is that you know, since there's been so little interest in preparing students for the economy of the 20th century, I don't see re- much reason to think there'll be interest in preparing them for the economy of the 21st century. The main saving grace is that uh, is that most training is actually done by employers on the job. And the main function of schools is just to sort out people that employers think are worthy of training in real skills from those that they don't think that are, are worthy of training in real skills. But I mean, ultimately, like it's employers that do almost all the real training in the economy. And if the economy changes a lot, then they're still going to have to do it because like, like where else will they get workers? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's an interesting point you make about um, automation, Brian. I guess I had a conversation with Tyler Cowan uh, last Mm -hmm. year as well and he was pointing to some statistics around productivity um, skyrocketing since the turn of the millennium yet wage growth was pretty much stagnant and he pointed to the fact that this is the first time this has happened in a in recorded history whereas up until that point productivity and wages more or less grew in step with each other and I guess more recently an, an example of that might be, say, your Netflix versus your Blockbuster, where Netflix has a market cap of $90 billion with only 4,000 employees, yet Blockbuster's market cap was $5 billion, yet they had 60,000 employees. And we've managed to use technology to effectively um, replace a lot of what people did um, and ultimately give people a, a better product as well by, by virtue of that. And I guess that's... Yeah, but, well, I mean, if, if the Netflix versus Blockbuster comparison impresses you, just think about what we did to agriculture. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah exactly. Right, you know, so, you know, so like, this, you know, like this kind of thing has happened many times before. Mm-hmm. You, know, you, know, a, you know, a lot of economic progress is figuring out a way for a small number of people to deliver a massive amount of goods to a large number of people, which is what happened with agriculture and it was happening with some internet industries. Um, I mean, like in terms of, you know, like it's the only time in history that there's been this decoupling of productivity rises with, with, with wage increases. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, again, I, I think that's probably just, you know, like, like either, you know, a short run thing. So like in the U.S., there, there have been substantial increases in wages recently, which are yeah. probably catching up. Or it's just a problem with the data. Or again, I think a lot of it is, is likely just that we don't adequately include Netflix in the consumer price index. So if we if we properly accounted for the amazing new innovations that we're getting, then living then wages probably have actually risen. It's just that we're not you know, not keeping score properly. So right. yeah, so you know, like like yeah, I mean this this is a long running argument that I've had with Tyler. Although something we agree on is that well, at least measure measure productivity gains since 1970 or so were less than in the in the 30 years before that. So you know again, there's not that much sign that there's going to be a huge increase in productivity. It hasn't happened yet. Right. Uh, so, and again, like, like, you know, like, how can that possibly be? Well, it's because you can read a hundred stories about a hundred industries that are that are radically transforming, and they can all be true. And yet, the economy has ten thousand industries. Mm. So you can read a, you can read an amazing story every day, and yet it doesn't mean that the economy is transforming. Uh, I mean, we, uh, wish it were. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, I guess you're more an advocate that we. Either the data is is wrong, not conclusive, doesn't account for other 
variables mm-hmm. in terms of the productivity or perhaps we're in a productivity paradox where maybe wage growth just hasn't caught up and we haven't mm-hmm. restructured the economy to extract as much value as possible from, say, these new technologies and then distribute those gains through to society. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and especially I think a lot of the gains just go to consumers now rather than either firms or workers, mm. right? But of course, most most workers are consumers, so... Uh, but you know that you know. But again, like you know, some, something quite similar happened with agriculture too. I mean, which of course, you know, historically is the overwhelmingly most important industry in the economy, and now hardly anyone works in it. I guess Australia maybe a little bit more than in the U.S. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I know in the U.S. something like eighty uh, percent of Americans uh, were employed in agriculture in the at the start of the twentieth century. Now it's something like two percent, if my numbers aren't yeah. wrong. And yeah, I think, I think it's, it's probably more like eighty percent in eighteen hundred than nineteen hundred. Okay. But yeah. but yeah, but yeah, but like under. 2% now is true. I think it's even under 1% now, yeah. if I remember. Yeah. And, and so I so, guess, you know, yeah. if history is any, any, anything to go by, we've always created more jobs than we've destroyed with yeah, every of wave of innovation. I guess we've never there's had... Al- there's, always, oh, there's always something else people can do. I mean, I mean you know, if, if employment can survive the mechanization of agriculture, it can survive anything. Yeah. And I guess I mean, it's... Um, like, I mean, a conversation I had with uh, Tim O'Reilly, who published a book recently called What's the Future and, and Why It's Up to Us. I mean, he was pointing to the fact that, you know, We've never had these types of technologies like you know, potentially artificial intelligence and, and blockchain and all this sort of stuff, which can have a, a massive impact on the way we go about doing things. But what he was saying was it's up to us to effectively create new industries, new things that we that didn't ex- exist before. And if you look at the last, say, 20, 25 years alone, which is a very small microcosm of human history, I mean – Things like typing a, a few words into a search bar and suddenly you've got all the answers in front of you. Things like pressing a button on a little glass screen and suddenly you've got a black car in front of you in two minutes. I mean, these are new things that we imagined. And I guess a big part of it is up to humanity to imagine new things to do with this technology to therefore create new opportunities for, for people to, to do something. Um, yeah. So, I mean, fortunately, it's, uh, you know, creating new industries is not up to me personally because I don't know what to do. Yep. But, <laughs> but I'm glad. But I'm glad that there are imaginative and uh, workaholic people that are uh, that are that are around to do it. And mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, and it's it's going to happen. And like everything will be fine and and great. Actually, is the most reasonable scenario. Well, very very optimistic, which is which is good to good to see. Um, and. Yeah. What, what but education, it, won't, but education won't be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, so yes, so, so be like you know, you know, business. I believe in education sector. Eh. Not so much. Not so much. So, I, I guess what I hear oftentimes, Brian, from people who are criticizing the education sector, or at least just looking for ways that it could be improved, is that one fundamental thing that perhaps all um, levels of education should be doing better is teaching kids or students how to learn, like learning how to learn. So that doesn't matter what uh, changes come their way, they'll be able to tackle that um, you know, with 100% energy and focus and, and resilience. Whereas much of what the education fo- system focuses on seems to be rote learning. Remember, write it down. You know, it's more about rewarding memory than it is the ability to learn something, to solve complex problems, to collaborate with other people, to leverage emerging technologies, to to create new solutions, and so on. Right. So, learning how to learn, like the, you know, the ideal sounds fantastic, mm. uh, but there's a whole field uh, in educational psychology that's been studying learning how to learn for a century. Usually they go you know, when researchers enter into the field thinking, oh, it's got to be doable. I can do this. And then after 20 or 30 years of failed efforts, they say, wow, it's super hard to teach people how to learn. So, I mean, I would say you know, like you know, most of the evidence is that teaching students how to how to think or how to learn or inculcating critical thinking is almost impossible, and it's basically a moonshot. Uh, and actually, if you could just go and use school to teach them basic skills successfully, teach them reading and writing, get, you know, get all get like basically every student to be literate and numerate, that would be an enormous improvement over the status quo. Mm. I mean, essentially, you know, like, like teaching kids how to think, that is a total moonshot. I think it would be uh, and like I, I would think it would be amazing if we could just get the basics done of getting you know, like ninety five percent literacy and numeracy, which at least for the U S. we do a lot worse than that. So, I mean, again, like, like, so, like, like, you know, like, like, if you got kids that are doing that are already doing that stuff well, then it's easy to start putting, you know, pushing the goalposts. 
But again, like like, you know, like in the U.S., I guess say about a third of American adults are really like ultimately qualify as barely literate or numerate. And so, if you know, if they could have just been taught that stuff in school, that would be way better than what we've got. Yeah, and, and I guess, like you said, it's about where you are on the um, playing field as to how far mm-hmm. you want to push out those goalposts. And you know, right. rightly you said, right. um, I think there was some stat in two thousand and three, the United States Department of Education gave. 18,000 Americans, the National Assessment of liter- Adult Literacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and fewer than a third of college graduates received a composite score of proficient, and about a fifth were at the basic or below basic level, which is crazy yeah. to think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so, you know, and, and, and again, the main thing is that these tests are easy. So <laughs> it's not it's not yeah. that they have super high standards where only Albert Einstein counts as proficient in math. You know, like, like if you read the test, it's the kind of thing where you're like, how could people not know this stuff? And yet, oh my God, I guess the people that I know personally aren't a represent, representative sample of Americans. Uh, so you know, like you know, people really just aren't aren't very good at this stuff. Yeah. I mean, this all goes goes to the question: Well, how do people get good at their jobs? And the real the real answer is specific practice. Mm-hmm. Like you just like if you want to get someone good at being a pilot, you don't go and teach them how to think. You go and get them into a flight simulator, and and then once once they're safe enough to put them into a cockpit, you put them into the cockpit. Mm-hmm. If you want to get them good at delivering babies, you don't give them lecture on lectures on baby delivering theory. You go and get them in a room and get them get them actually participating and doing it yes. and gradually ramp it up. Yes. I mean, I, I often remember when I, I you know, like you know, we we had coddled my older kids and they were still getting help showering when they were about seven years old and then a new baby was coming and like right, well, look we can't do this anymore they need to get independent mm-hmm. and I was given the task of teaching them how to shower themselves and then I sit there thinking well what do I do give them a lecture on showering theory <laughs> like, no you know learning by doing practice and like yeah. here's what you do do what I do no doing it wrong do it again do it again drill drill drill. Yeah. And like, you know, like, like if you go to educational psychology, this is the people, people, way people really get good at their jobs. It's by doing the jobs, learning by doing, specific practice, specific training. It's, you know, it sounds boring, but this is what works. And the other stuff is mostly pie in the sky. Mm. And that's um, the other solution you point to in your book. I mean, the first was cutting education spending, and the second is more vocational education, um, things like boot camps, short modular courses, mm-hmm. just in time. Because right, right. And, and especially yeah. just you know, like basic things like get early teenagers, 13, 14, 15, doing jobs, if, especially if they don't like school. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of kids who just hate school. They're miserable there. They're resistant. And many of those kids would much rather be learning how to repair an engine or do plumbing. Mm. And why not? I mean, I yeah. say I say it would be better not only for the individual, but much better for society that you take people out of this meaningless rat race of just getting stickers in your forehead and teach them how to get real skills. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily need to be just, you know, blue collar works like repairing engines yeah, and, and, and such. I mean, today you can do an online, say, coding course or a three-month mm-hmm. boot camp or it could be a face-to-face yeah. boot camp and things like that where you learn the fundamentals of digital marketing or data science or, or, or um, front-end yeah, web development, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, and absolutely. And the main thing I say is it's just important not to make people do the full normal thing, and then if after they failed at that, then say, "Oh, we've got a different thing that you could try instead." Yeah. You know, if, if, if there's a kid who has not done well at school, and then he's 18 and he finishes, and you say, "Oh, well, you, well, college isn't for you." Oh, uh, fine. We'll go and, and teach you, you know, uh, you know like, like data science or something. At that point, I think it's like the, it's probably just too late, especially if it's a, a, an angry young male. He's going to say, "No, no, that's it." Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm done. No way. I'm trying it's, something it's, else. It's, so you know, better better just to start them much younger. Yeah, it's funny. Um, a professor of psychology, uh, Jordan Peterson, talks about the lobster, and he he says that when a lobster scraps with another lobster and loses the fight, he's very much unlikely to fight again. But when they uh, um, inject a little bit of serotonin into that lobster, he uh, fronts up again. But what you're talking about there is similar in the sense that, you know, if you've gone through school, you know, say 13 years of education, primary school and secondary school, and you've, it's just not been for you, you're very much unlikely to say, well, I don't want to go back to school now after that terrible experience that I had. Whereas if you get them a little bit earlier, like you said, when they're 14, mm-hmm. 15, and perhaps put them into something a little bit more vocational where they can get hands on, yeah. um, they yeah. feel more likely or, or, to take or, 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 Yeah, or a lot more vocational. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we... Uh, I mean, you know, I'll, t- I'll take what I can get. So, I mean, you know, like, like I'll admit, you know, The Case Against Education, it's a radical book, but I'm not the kind of radical who says either do everything I say or I'm not going to talk to you. You know, like, you know, like even, even very modest changes in these directions, I think, would be an improvement. You know, just like, you know, cut education spending by 1%. I think if I could accomplish that, that would be amazing. Definitely. Yeah. Well, uh, when, when we talk about the uh, extent of waste in the system, 1% is actually a very, very big number. So, 
Um, I'm with you there. Um, so earlier you were talking about the, the playing field and pushing back the goalposts and you know, if we can just get people to basic levels of numeracy and, and literacy, that'll be a win. So what if you're already beyond that level and say you're on the proverbial 20-yard line, you're within field goal distance, should we be revisiting then perhaps the way people learn? For example, focusing on 80-20. Like, I'm a big fan of this concept of, say, if I was learning mm -hmm. a new language, I will deconstruct it to the smallest possible unit, which is, say, words. I will find the 20% of words that I'm going to use 80% of the time. I'm mm -hmm. going to focus on them. And therefore, I'm going to learn something fundamentally quicker. I'm going to put it into practice. I'm going to practice those words rather than, say, focusing on the entire, you know, 100% of stuff I need, I need mm -hmm. to know. Um, is there something to be said about that in terms of let's take an 80-20 approach to knowing what we need to know? Obviously, in certain situations, if I'm learning you know, heart bypass surgery, I probably want to know every single little detail. But in certain cases, perhaps there's something to be said about overlearning. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so again, I think it would be amazing if students learn 20% of the subject. It's just so much more than what they, what they do right now. Yeah. Immediately, so... You know, like, for example, if you go and take a look at what adult Americans actually know about American history, mm -hmm. I mean, a, a fair summary is that they know – is the average American knows half of the very most basic facts, yeah. right? Just, you know, just get down to the level of facts that you think ev – like, everyone would know them, and then average person knows half of that. Mm. <laughs> wow. All right. So, you know, again, like, if you, if you, if, if you could actually just inc inculcate even the basics, that would be a big step up compared to the status quo. And again, of, co of course, part of this is people just forget the stuff. But yeah, I mean, I'd say the, the main problem with our system as it exists is not that we try to go and make people learn 100% of the material. I mean, it's, it's really that like, like, like we, 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 don't, we don't even accomplish the, you know, the, the bare basics. And, and you know, like maybe people know the bare basics on the day of the final exam, although I think that's optimistic. But to actually retain the basics, hardly anyone does that. And, and again, even stuff like literacy and numeracy that you, that you get practice in all the time, people are, 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 are shockingly bad at those. Yeah. And then, for, and then for all the other subjects in school, for the, for that stuff, I say, you know, to, to basically it's a rounding error, and adults know next to nothing about you know, history, science, foreign languages. This is stuff where whatever test you took, by the time you're an adult, you just don't know it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, unless of course you use it every day. Yeah, and I know you've said this about your own classes as well, where you say you you try to teach for comprehension, but ultimately it's memory, and most students will forget everything mm -hmm. that you taught them, say within a year or two. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, like I, I make a big effort to really teach for understanding. I don't have any road exams. Like everything's open book and open notes to encourage students to actually comprehend the material. Yeah. But, but yeah, but you know, you know, like my, like I could just fail, you know, fail eighty percent of my students. Uh, that's <laughs> uh, since I since I have tenure, I wouldn't get fired for that. But it would certainly lead me to be very unpopular with a lot of people. <laughs> so yeah, so you know, like you know, like you know, I mean, I you know, I I curve things the normal way, but at the same time, I try to make sure that students who really do want to learn the subject, uh, like like have a bounty of material that's available to them. Yep. But then I realize most of the students are going to just find the material so boring. And and again, like like you know, according to student evaluation. I'm a very entertaining teacher, but mm -hmm. I'm not entertaining enough for for most of the students to show up all the time. So, <laughs> and, and and that's like like what I honestly have to face in the room and say middle of the semester half the students aren't here. Hmm. I guess that they're saying when they say that I'm an excellent teacher, they're saying yeah you're excellent for a professor, mm -hmm. which is boring compared to the internet. Yeah. Right? And, and you know like you know, actions speak louder than words. That's what they're telling me. Yeah. And I guess I mean. When people are taking, say, your class, for example, some of them would be there because they're genuinely interested in the topic, whereas others might be there because they need the credits to get a particular yeah. degree, and they're the ones that perhaps won't find it as um, engaging and won't turn up half the time. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I'd say that the vast majority are there for the credit because, I mean, I'm very open saying anyone who wants to learn the subject is uh, on earth is free to come to my class or everyone's welcome. Yep. And yet the number of people that unofficially attend my classes is very low. Mm. So, mm. you know, and, like, and, and, yeah, and yet if people were there primarily because they want to learn the subject, you know, the class should be packed with outside people Definitely. who are like, hey I, hey, I heard there's free labor economics here. Can I have some? I'm like, yeah, you can have it all. But, you know, of course, I can only make this offer just because there's so little actual demand for free education. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned um, also a few moments ago uh, that your tests aren't rote. You know, you've got open book. People can research things during the exam, which I think is 
it just makes sense because today with Google and everything else, I mean, in the real world, it's not like mm-hmm. when you're trying to solve a problem, oh, well, you're going to have to figure this one out all on yourself. And no, you can't use Google or any other person mm-hmm. out there or any book. You just got to figure it out. Um, man, that's not the reality of the world. So giving people or giving students that opportunity in an exam situation is at least starting to mimic um, the real world rather than saying, no, you just got to remember everything I told mm-hmm. you in the previous 12 weeks. Yeah, yeah, and especially it's trying to get people to practice the skills that you know, you know that 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 you can, that Google can't really do for you of just applying knowledge to to, to a at least somewhat new situation. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, couldn't agree more. Brian, you have left our audience with a, a lot of value bombs today. I think I'm going to have to go back and listen to this one a couple of times just to extract some of that value. Mm-hmm. Before we go, Brian, I've got to throw you into our three-question lightning round. Are you ready to rock and roll? All, all right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. So I'm not sure how you're going to answer question one, seeing as you've been effectively in school for 40 years, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Question one is if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle. So we could go back to 1978 and work with Woz and Jobs in a garage. Who would it be and why? Hmm. Well, that's tough. I really like being a professor. So, <laughs> this so, is why I hesitated yeah, asking you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's super fun. Uh, you know, like, like, you know, like it's just like a low-stress dream job for life. Yeah. Let's see. Like who would I really want to work with? Um. Hmm. So, I mean, I mean, so you know, like, like if, if I could actually have been part of Google, like, like, like in the early years, I think that would have been really exciting and, and, a, and a fun experience to bring to the table. So why don't I say that? Awesome. Easy. Uh, question number two is if you could ask anyone a question dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Ooh, ask anyone a question dead or alive. Let's see. Hmm. So the, yeah, these, these are pretty hard questions. I like, <laughs> uh, let's see. Hmm. Um, hmm. Any? Let's see. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I probably want to ask a question of Jesus. Actually, I think uh-huh. that would be. <laughs> uh, but as, as to what exactly I would ask him, uh, hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I. So yeah, just for my own historical curiosity, I think I'd want to go to Jesus and said, "All right, so can you just go and give me like a ten-page statement of your whole theology, just so we can go and check it against every all the other <laughs> people are going to put in your mouth again and just find out what's going on." Um, yeah, I, uh, partly I'm tempted to even go back earlier and just you know, like, like you know try to find like like the earliest uh, you know like, you know, like early you know, found founders of, of monotheism and mm-hmm. find out with them. But you know, Jesus, I think, is a pretty focal figure. So yeah, Jesus. Yeah. And well, yeah, and what 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 are your teachings anyway, Jesus? I'd like yeah, you know, like in detail, clearly, I'd like to know, please. Yeah, because we we may have uh, misinterpreted it over the last two thousand odd years, and, and uh, a lot of Chinese whispers going That's- around. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. And lucky last, Brian, is all about you and rituals and routines. I mean, you've published a number of books. You're a professor of economics at George Mason University. You're appearing on podcasts all over the world. I'm sure you do a lot of other cool stuff. I mean, how do you stay on top of your game? Do you have any daily practices that you partake in? Well, let's see. I mean, I'll, I'll say you know, I've got four kids, and I uh, always try to put my kids first. So, I mean, I play I play with my kids every every day I'm around. Uh, you know, and you know, like, and to me, you know, to me, that's that's the most important stuff. I homeschool my older kids, and whenever they come with me with a question, they're always so bashful. Says, "Sorry, I hate to interrupt you." And I always say, "Look, you're not an interruption of my work, son. You are my work. You're my yeah, most important work." So, you know, like, like that, you know, that's what, that's what, that's what really matter, matters the most to me. Um, you know, like, like, you know, like, I guess other things, so like, you know, turning off all notifications, I never need anything beeping at me or making any noise. Uh-huh. Um, and then, you know, like, you know, like, so, and I, and I, and I and like, and, and professionally, I guess the main thing is, you know, like, like, you know, to become extremely knowledgeable about anything that you're writing about before you write it and write at your absolute peak of knowledge. So whenever I, whenever I wrote a section in The Case Against Education, it's because in the few days before, I had reread everything I thought was important to read about it, and then I'd read everything else that seemed possibly important that those people had cited. And at the moment I was writing, I had a stack of everything that I thought was relevant right in front of me. Mm. And, and then I wrote then, knowing that I would probably forget quite a bit of stuff, but at least knowing that at the moment I wrote, I was at the absolute peak of, of knowledge of that subject for that I'm likely to ever have for my whole life. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think building upon that, always taking the extra step to look for evidence against what you believe. Yeah, yeah, in any yeah, yeah def- definitely, definitely. And, and never to let in a disciplinary border stop you. So I'm yeah. an economist. But you know, if all that I read were other economists on this subject, it would have been a terrible book. 
mm-hmm. right? It's, it's only because I branched out and read people in psychology, sociology, uh, education research, and then put it all together, yeah. right? And you know, just to find out, like, like, are there smart people in other fields who think economists are wrong about this? Well, mm-hmm. what do they have to say for themselves? And like, and or like, or sometimes economists will, will, will like said, well, it doesn't really matter what subject you're teaching, people learn how to learn. And then I said, well, what about what the psychologists say about this? Like, oh, there's a field where they actually study our, our, our lazy excuses. Yeah. Uh, well, let, let's find out what they have to say. So, you know, you, you know, like, like, so like always try to answer a question rather than just, you know, like work within a disciplinary boundary. So that's really important for me as a scholar. Uh, and then, you know, just a human being, like my simplest rule, this is one that I really needed to know when I was a kid and it took mm-hmm. me a long time, to, a long time to learn it. You know, always be friendly to people. Yeah. Right. Like, like, you know, uh, you know, and perhaps that's the message of Jesus that he would tell us. I don't know, but <laughs> Uh, you know, if you could al- always be friendly to people, you know, unilateral friendliness, even if they're, they don't treat you well, just be friendly to everyone. And, you know, like what you get back is, is well is well worth whatever humiliation you suffer as a result of having mm-hmm. to do it when other people aren't. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's a very valuable lesson to wrap up on, Brian. So people can pick up a copy of the book, The Case Against Education, on Amazon and all places good books are sold. They can find out more about yourself at bkaplan.com. That's Kaplan with a C. And they can connect with you on Twitter at Brian underscore Kaplan. And that's Brian with a Y. Is there anywhere else they should go to uh, find out more about you and connect, Brian? Yeah, well, I blog for EconLog. I've been doing that for over 10 years, so mm-hmm. I've got th- thousands of things up there. I've written on almost any subject you can imagine. So you know, if you want to know what I think about anything, you can Fantastic. go to EconLog, and it's, it's probably up there. We'll add that to the show notes for our listeners. Thanks again, Brian, for making the time. You've been an awesome guest. Thanks. Hope you enjoy the rest of your wintry Virginia afternoon. Thanks again. It's been a great pleasure, and I expect to enjoy the rest of my wintry Virginia afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi guys, Steve again. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to discuss episodes like this one, request guests for new episodes, propose questions, and access exclusive podcast-related content, join the brand new Future Squared Facebook group. Just search for the Future Squared group on Facebook or visit bit.ly forward slash Future Squared group. That's bit.ly forward slash Future Squared group. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, please take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Google Play. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. This episode was powered by Collective Campus. Until next time, Future Squared is out.